Ladies and gentlemen, Caitlin Domner is about to come on and rock your world. This woman is crushing it in sales, in processes, and putting in place sales teams that can really change the trajectory, the destiny of your business. So definitely stay tuned. She's accomplished a ton, worked with incredible companies and people. So definitely stay tuned. Before that, I'm talking to you. You're becoming your greatest possible self. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing to be on this journey to grow yourself with us. Keep showing up. Keep taking one step at a time. You're worth it. You deserve it. And just keep being you. Thank you. Next up is our iTunes review of the week. This week, I believe it's by M. Davis 777, who says, very inspirational and educational. This is the podcast to listen to if you're looking for both inspiration and education on a variety of topics to help you be the best you you can be. M. Davis 777, thank you so much for that review. If you want a chance to get shouted out on a future 12 hour live stream marathon and podcast, go to beergps.com forward slash iTunes or search Greatest Possible Self on the Apple Podcast Store. Give us a review. Let us know what you love, what you want to see more of, how we can improve the show for you. I love to see that feedback and share these testimonials and what people are saying with my team so that they know all the great things that we are doing. So thank you in advance for doing that. I'm going to read and uh, introduce, I should say, Caitlin in just a second here. Before that, grab a piece of paper, grab a pen, be ready to take notes. This is going to be freaking powerful. and You definitely want to stick around all the way through till the end because one idea has the power to change everything in your life. After studying at Oxford University and getting her MBA from Biola University, Caitlin Domner launched Virtual Coaching Sales in March 2013. And in their first 33, I love that alignment, months of business, they had made their first million dollars. Within six years, they had generated over $10 million in new revenue for their clients, and their team has built and managed sales teams for some of the most prestigious names in the coaching industry, including. Deepak Chopra. She has published multiple books, including The Unseen Sales Machine and Sell With Heart. I think she just had a new one called Sex Every Day come out pretty recently as well, right, Caitlin? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you're you're doing amazing things. You're you're writing books. You have a beautiful family. Uh, you're crushing it in sales and helping build sales teams. You're doing awesome things. So thank you for being here to share with our audience your your wisdom, your experience, and your life. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Chris. Yes. Let's dive right in. The theme today is patterns of transformation. What does that mean for you, Caitlin? Patterns of transformation. Um, in context of what we're going to talk about, sales, I would say that for me, it, transformation is starts, everything starts with your mind, mm. right? We have our thoughts have the power to become things. And so being careful what we think about mm. and the transformation. So I was working with our clients today and I was mentioning that sales is demon wrestling for a living. So you have to wrestle your own demons first. And then you wrestle everybody else's demons wow. when you're in this conversation. Wow, that's <laughs> so good. <laughs> that's so it's so true because like really we have to be aligned with ourselves, confident with ourselves, love ourselves. Because if we care more about what other people think, then we'll just get shut down. We'll get smashed. You know, like we're there'll be mirrors for us and what we feel about ourselves. And then then we have to deal with hey, what what is this person's sincere concerns about working with us? And are we able to be with those concerns and not you know make it a big deal, blow it out of proportion, or get triggered, shut down? small make ourselves small because of that and to still stand for our value it's like it is it is a perfect incubator for everyone's growth <laughs> absolutely absolutely you gotta you gotta be a window is what we say mm. for somebody else to make their best decision because that's it's good. in that moment of decision that their destiny changes and so that's yeah. what i love about sales and especially with the industry of transformational leaders that we work with the, the transformation starts at that moment when they say yes to themselves. I'm going to do something differently than I've ever done it before. And the self-worth piece to your point is I'm worth investing in. And that's where we get to kind of really get to the heart of their self-worth, their belief in their vision. And are they willing to step out into the unknown and tackle their fears, even if it's scary and even if it costs money to do so? Yeah, I love it. I love it. I know you've you've invested so much in your journey, personal development, becoming the best version of yourself, being a better leader. Like you, you and your husband are doing awesome, awesome things. Tell us a little bit more about Sales Map and what you guys are doing today. Yeah, so virtual coaching sales was where we started, and we, as you've said, we were managing the sales teams. 
So we required a base, we required inbound leads, we required 30% uh, revenue right off the top for anything that we closed. It was just a big endeavor and we could only afford to work with seven figure and higher clients because mm -hmm. they had the infrastructure that could support an entire sales department. And we have since partnered with Tobin Slavin and Janet Clark to create salesmap.me. So think of it as like a, a branch yeah. of the company that's designed to work with entrepreneurs who are committed to growing their business, who know they need some support, and we can get them ready for a sales team person, as well as find them the person, place it on their project, and teach them how to manage them themselves. Mm. So what I love about this is instead of me coming along and driving the Rolls Royce for you, I'm teaching you how to drive your own Corvette. Uh, and then handing you the keys. So it's really important that you own the process. I've become increasingly convinced of this, that you don't want to have somebody else being the only rainmaker on your team. You don't want to be the only rainmaker on your team, uh, but you need to master the entire process from how do we generate the leads, how do we educate, nurture, and qualify the leads, how do we close the leads, and how do we support them in their transformational journey afterwards. So really walking our clients through the entire client journey from how do they first hear about you all the way to how they start referring people to you because they're so in love with your services yes. and really thinking of the entire buyer experience as it really is one very long sales conversation and really supporting them at every step of the way. Yeah. Yeah. I love that because I think a lot of people think, oh, well, once I open the relationship or close the sale and, and they've bought from me, then, you know, it's just, well, it's performance, you know, it's, it's delivery. But that is also what a, what a beautiful opportunity to shine, to continue to sell, to continue to persuade why we're the bee's knees. And then they're, they become your biggest advocate and share with all of their friends who they're probably similar to them, similar mindset, similar location, business, industry, whatever it might be so that we can serve more people. And I think a lot of people drop the ball on that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love it. So this is this is great stuff. Let's go back into your journey, Caitlin, because yeah. you you like have really accomplished a lot in a short amount of time. Um, tell us like where did where did sales begin being important for you? Well, yeah. Mm, I will tell <laughs> myself eight years ago I had never sold anything. I hated sales. My dad's an engineer. My mom is an attorney. We were this sort of family that hung up on telemarketers when they called. Yep. <laughs> really hated the idea of sales. I thought it had to be sleazy and pushy and mm. and I did not like it. And so I, when I got my MBA, I thought, hey, I know, I'll be a consultant. And um, didn't realize how naive that was, but mm. put on my shingle, hired a coach. The coach liked what I was doing so much that he's like, hey, well, why don't you sell for me? And I said, eh, you don't understand. I can't sell anything. <laughs> and so uh, he had a sales consultant, my first business partner, Nate, uh, who brought me under his wing and said, hey, you just have to be the appointment setter. You just have to reach out to people, have a great conversation with them, see where their problems lie, and we'll start solving some problems together. And once he broke that down, I was like, well, I like all of those things you just said. I love meeting new people. I love hearing their stories. I love figuring out what the problem is and creating a solution with them. Yeah. And I think that's usually what people don't understand is that sales broken down is about building relationships, starting a conversation, yes. getting to know somebody, falling in love with them, letting them fall in love with you. Um, sales is in everything we do. If you've ever asked somebody out on a date, that was a sales conversation. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> it's all about mastering the art of influence. And so he, he was able to start me and kind of circumvent my fear of sales by not calling it sales. Mm -hmm. So I just feel he put people into his calendar and he did the selling. He did the closing, if you right. will. He talked about the money. He handled like objections. <laughs> exactly. All that fancy sales stuff that I was <laughs> ready. And then things were going so well. And he's like, well, why don't we hire people to do this for us? So we hired mm -hmm. employment centers and we hired closers. And now I am suddenly a sales manager. The girl who has never sold anything, doesn't know how to sell, is now managing the sales team. And so I sort of learned trial by fire. I was, when closers were having objections, I would say, so Bob is having this objection. Mary, what do you think? How would you <laughs> overcome that objection? <laughs> so I had them basically teaching themselves because I didn't know what to teach them. But in the process, I learned I learned how to sell. I was learning from actual salespeople what I was supposed to be doing. And of course, Nate was nurturing me and teaching me. And we went through 
oh, let's see, there was the Sandler sales model and the uh, spin field guide and mm -hmm. Brian Tracy. So he was making me consume a lot of curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found was the most effective was just to fall in love with the person that I was working with. Mm -hmm. So I really believe that sales is an act of love and service, mm -hmm. that you have to love the person you're talking with. You have to love the offer that you've created. And this is just a matchmaking game that you get mm -hmm. to play. And so if you show up to every single sales conversation, committing to loving that person and serving them, no matter what the outcome is, you can win 100% of the time. Mm. Even if you're only closing one out of three deals, right? That still means like if this is baseball, you're still only hitting the ball three out of 10 times. Right? Which is, is a good ratio in it's baseball. Really good ratio <laughs> in baseball, yeah. Um, that still means that you're not hitting the ball seven times. Yep. And so just remembering that the the goal in a sales conversation is never to win the deal. Mm. It's not the always be closing mindset. It really is can I love and serve them? And if you do, then you will win on every single sales conversation, mm. no matter what the outcome is. So I'm working through my own mindset stuff through this journey. We decided to go start a marketing company and we love him for it. And I was suddenly left on my own. I was um, nine months pregnant at the time wow. and I suddenly had to start selling my own stuff and then and I like literally the week after my second son was born I closed what had been our biggest deal it ended up being like a $300,000 client for us yeah. and that that was the turning point I told my husband like I can't do this alone you need to come home and help me so we used his 12 weeks of baby bonding time to test that out and get our finances in order. And then we, we decided to do it full time now, six years ago. Um, and it was one of my, my team members who told me like, Caitlin, you're a sales ninja. You don't realize that you're good at sales. You just do this so naturally. And that allowed me to really own this identity. Like, no, I really am good at sales. I don't do it the way anybody else does it. Mm -hmm. But there are systems, there's structure, there are certain questions that get better results. And I'm always trying to, what's, what's one better way to ask? Optimize, them? yeah. Yes, always. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, just really relaxing into it and trusting myself. And that's what I'm always trying to encourage our clients and our team members is really don't overthink it. Have mm -hmm. some basic fundamentals, the framework that you're working in, right? You got to know their goals, their challenges, their motivation, their pain. Right? There are four key things that you just need to know all the time. Yeah. But at the same time, it's the dance, right? Like mm. there's a lot of improv that happens on every single sales conversation and trusting yourself, trusting the universe, making sure that everything's going to work out just fine. That yeah. isn't just going to take your stress level down and allow you to be that window that I talked about earlier where mm. you are not in the way of this person and their destiny. You are, you're the frame through which they walk. Um, I like to think of sales as being a midwife. My second son that I mentioned, uh, he he was born at home. And having a midwife through that process was so valuable. Mm. She's really just coaching me, right? I'm the one doing the work, but right. she's the one who's kind of guiding the experience. And at one point, I thought he was stuck. And she said, oh, sweetie, he's not stuck. This is completely normal. Just keep pushing <laughs> right so in sales right that overcoming objections is really just it's okay you're not stuck just keep pushing like you can do this um and so really viewing this as like a really beautiful journey where you can hold somebody's hand wow. on what can be the most life-changing decision for them is really i've come to just really fall in love with the whole sales process because well that's that's one reason i love it the other reason I love it on the flip side is that it is the single most empowering skill set that anybody can learn, whether you're an entrepreneur or not. Like mastering the art of sales mm. is in today's age the equivalent of learning how to hunt for cavemen, right? Mm -hmm. You know that you can just go out into the wilderness and bring home food. Mm. And same thing when you master the art of sales, you will always have financial security. You will always be able to provide for yourself and your family. Because this is the equivalent of going out and finding food. There is no economy in which a commission-based salesperson who is really good at their job cannot make really good money. Like upturn, upsides, downsides, it does not matter. Mm -hmm. Sales will always be the engine that drives commerce. And that's going to make sure that you can make really good money for yourself and your family no matter what.
Yeah, I love it. And I think every every person who's listening to this wants to lead their life, right? Lead, Be the best version of themselves that they can be. So I think oftentimes we think of sales as this transaction of money. And that is one form of sales, but there's also the sales of a vision to a team, to to you know our our partner, right? Like you said, the, having that date, that next date, to to have another conversation. Like, are we selling that person? Are we are we being a window to what is possible when they continue to to grow with us, to have a, a great time with us, to to be intimate, to have great conversations? Like mm-hmm. that is it's it's effective everywhere. And I think yeah. it, we all like imagine the world that we're going to live in in probably 20, 30, 40 years when everyone is taught sales as far as like be a great communicator, share Mm -hmm. people, what's share with people, what's important to you, share your frustrations, share what doesn't work. And like, Mm -hmm. wow, what, what amazing, an amazing world we'll live in. And what I've found is that kids are instinctively good at this, right? Mm -hmm. My daughter, when she was two, uh, she, she was like, daddy, come look at something. And he's like, daddy's watching the TV, sweetie. And she disappears. And she comes back with this pink ribbon and she hands the piece one end to daddy and says, daddy, don't let go of the ribbon and he takes it. And then she starts walking towards the bedroom. <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is micro commitments at its best. <laughs> daddy's not ready to get off the couch, but daddy's willing to grab the end of the ribbon. And so I realized like watching my kids now, because one's three and six and eight, like watching them, they just, they do this instinctively. They have this self-determination. They know what they want. They are completely convinced that they deserve to have what they want yep. and nothing is going to get in the way of uh, barring a spanking. Uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> that level of commitment just reminds me like, ah, we are born with this, but mm-hmm. somewhere along the way, our, our like lizard brain, our fear kicks in and our desire to fit in kicks in and our mm-hmm. desire to be liked kicks in. And we don't want to be perceived a certain way. And so we lose that. But at the heart of it, we are we are born to be, to your point, communicators, influencers, to be in community with one another. Um, and I believe that we have a birthright to abundance. So of course we want more. Of course we want it better. Like that's what we are wired to do is to be on the leading edge of thought. And so that desire, I believe that desiring piece, it shows up in sales, in entrepreneurship, in wanting a better life for yourself and your family. And to your point, yes, sales will absolutely make that a reality no matter where you are or who you are. Yeah. Yeah. And also what you said earlier about like loving this person, like falling in love with this person. Like how can I see this person in their best light? How can I remind them how brilliant, how beautiful, how epic, how smart, how intelligent they are and just be a reflection to them, you know, and, and hear, really hear like what is important to this person. I love how you said like, you know, what are, what are their real, I don't know if you said needs, but you said their, their goals, motivations, that kind of thing. Like what, what's really important to them. Like if we hear that, that's like so many people don't have an opportunity to just express that, you know, in a, in a safe environment. So as a sales professional, a leader, whatever it might be, drawing that out of people is so powerful. Mm-hmm. It really is. Yeah. You get some of the most, I call it a sacred space. Like the yeah. sales conversation is a sacred bubble wow. in which you can be really honest about the best and the worst, your biggest, most audacious vision of how you want to change the world and and reach a million people yeah. and your deepest fear that you're really not good enough and this isn't going to work out and that uh, nobody will believe you or that you're going to lose everything mm-hmm. that you've worked so hard to create, right? Like your biggest vision and your deepest fears, this is, this is a sales conversation. And so the better you become at holding that space for someone mm-hmm. uh, and giving them that ability to be open, to be vulnerable with you, uh, this like this is what lights me up is being that that vehicle for somebody to see something they've never seen before yeah it's powerful it's powerful stuff caitlin i want to talk about when people are that, that we've given people some tips like how to look at sales differently, that they can possibly make some shifts, improve their sales. I also know that we want to talk to people who are already being successful with sales and want to systemize things, want to take it to the whole next level. Where, like with all these processes and opportunities to implement these things that you know that are in your mind that, you know, you have all these systems and processes for, where do people start with that? Great question. So usually we find that about six figures, uh, a coach or an entrepreneur, somebody who's usually doing a service-based business. Um, Chris, can you still hear me okay? I, I can hear okay. you. It was freezing for a second, but I think we're good now. 
Okay. I'm yeah. Back. We're good. All right. Sorry. Right. Um, so the if, when you're building your business, yes, you want to master the sales and the marketing piece for yourself. Yep. But there will come a point where you start hitting a capacity block. And there are two people that you want to hire. You either hire an operations person to help you take off some of the load of fulfillment, or you hire a salesperson. Now, it really depends on how good you are at sales. If you're a natural born salesperson and you love the sales element, then I would suggest hiring an operations person so that you have more time to be selling. Yeah. If you don't particularly enjoy the sales process, then I would say hire that person first and just focus on the fulfillment piece. Mm -hmm. So the, the reason, the other reason that I really like hiring a salesperson first is that they can then finance the other hires. So mm -hmm. a salesperson wow. is never, uh, it's never an expense. It's always an investment, right? Unless they're really terrible, but we try to avoid that. <laughs> we um, have systems and processes for yeah, that. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, ideally you're, you're, you're maybe paying your salesperson a hundred thousand, mm. but it's because they made you 300 to 500,000 that year. Yep. Right. So if at any point you can invest in something that's going to give you a 500% return on your investment, like do it. Yep. Right. Uh, and that is going to give you the consistent cash flow because the biggest reason that most entrepreneurs do not have consistent cash flow is either number one, they don't have predictable lead flow. So they mm. haven't gotten their marketing dialed in or they're trying to do both sales and operations. So mm. they go and they sell some stuff and then they have to go fulfill it and they take their sales hat off and then they run out of money and they say, oh crap, and they go sell some stuff again mm. and they start the whole cycle. Um, so you need somebody who just has the sales hat firmly on their head every single day, day in, day out. And so you can be focusing on the other areas of your business. So once you can get past that block, either hiring operations or hiring salesperson, now you're going to have a lot more consistency. Mm -hmm. And consistency allows you to start building strategically because you can afford to hire somebody, right? So if you have inconsistent cash flow, you're not going to feel comfortable hiring somebody mm -hmm. because the money might run out. Mm -hmm. um, and so making sure that you have that consistent cash flow is really critical for growth. It's also going to give you the money to invest in a coach who's not necessarily generating revenue for you, mm. but is allowing you to bring more revenue in because they can help you fulfill it. But it's not a frontline item. It's a backline item mm. in terms of capacity. So having that frontline person who's generating money for you is going to be a really great first step so that then you can be strategic about bringing on an operations person, a finance person, a marketing team yeah. and help you scale to the next level. Powerful. I want to I want to talk about the person who's at that maybe the inconsistency level that might be thinking, hey, if I bring on a salesperson, they can help me be consistent. Is that is that is that doable? Is that like I, I'm thinking that the person maybe they don't believe in their own product at the level to to be consistent, or is it just like they're trying to wear too many hats and they're trying to you know fulfill the things? What do you recommend to those types of situations? So we take people through a process. Number one, we want to test the offer. So we always begin looking at the offer. Is there a way that we could make it irresistible, mm -hmm. which allows us to increase the value, which allows yep. us to increase the price? Yep. So we would always prefer to sell a $10,000 thing to a $1,000 thing. Yep. Uh, and we would prefer to sell a $100,000 thing to a $10,000 thing. So just figuring out, is there, and of course, right alongside looking at your offers, looking at your niche. Mm -hmm. So some people, they just have an intrinsically difficult niche. So mm -hmm. we've worked with some mindset coaches who specialize on money blocks. And I was like, holy crap. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what you're trying to do, okay? <laughs> trying to sell somebody a program when they have self-admitted minds, like mindset blocks around money and scarcity, is going to be an inherent difficulty in your niche choice. It's like, what did, what did your soul contract sign up for? <laughs> <laughs> so absolutely, we can have a nonprofit organization that deals with So we're looking at if there's a way that we can nuance the niche that either allows you to target uh, people with a more urgent mm -hmm. pain point, so they make better, faster buying decisions, or with just deeper pockets, right? So a corporation can afford to hire a hundred thousand dollar executive coach for one of their CEO, their like one of their C level executives, whereas most entrepreneurs are not investing a hundred thousand dollars in their personal development work. 
Hmm. So it's just looking at who is willing to invest at the level that I want to be doing it at. Hmm. And now you can get to a million dollars by selling 10 $100,000 programs or selling 100 $10,000 programs. It really doesn't matter to me. It's just, it will impact your marketing. And so this is where the next step is we have to flow chart your sales and marketing process. Sure. So we really think of the entire process as a continuum. And the way we break it down is you're either outbound or inbound. So we, we guarantee every one of our clients, a sales professional, mm -hmm. I'm a sales pro, but you get to tell us if you want somebody who's an outbound person, right. who's going and finding great prospects, nurturing those relationships, starting those conversations, doing the education, the qualifying process, and then putting them onto your calendar to close, mm. or do you want a closer? So we, mm. had, we have some people who they're in the B2B sector. They want to reach those corporations. They don't trust somebody else to negotiate a six-figure contract for them. Mm. They do want somebody that they trust who's not an automated chat bot to be working those high-end networking relationships for them. Yep. So an outbound person is perfect. On the other hand, we have some clients who already have a funnel built, right? Mm -hmm. There's like two comma club people yeah. who they're like, man, I, I could book a hundred more leads this month if I had somebody to take the calls, but I'm out yeah. of bandwidth. Yeah. Fantastic. Let's put a closer in there and ramp up your ad spend budget so we can get their calendar filled and, and start making that money back for you. So we'll really look at your whole marketing process. Who are you targeting and how are you reaching them? Hmm. And we'll flow chart that process out. So the biggest mistake entrepreneurs make is, well, I know how to sell it. Somebody else should be sell, able to sell it at least as good as I am, if not better. And what we have to tell them is, you are the expert. You created this thing. You have probably several years worth of experience under your belt, if not several credentials and degrees and such like this. So even if you don't think you're a good salesperson, you're going to win because you are the face of the company. Mm. And so making sure that they recognize that the things that you have done naturally or instinctively, that unconscious confidence yeah. is really a problem when you're thinking about hiring a salesperson. Mm. You really need to break everything down into a step-by-step by step by step process mm. so that <laughs> so that anybody else can follow it. I don't like to say monkeys because I do love our sales pros, but right, we want to McDonaldize <laughs> your yeah. sales process. So that you don't need a magical unicorn in a in order to close deals for you. You want mm. somebody that you can go and you can find anybody who's smart, hungry, and teachable mm. and plop them in that role. They have a training manual. They have a checklist. They have a daily report that they're required for. They know how to follow instructions. Mm. You're working with them every day to make sure that things are caught within 24 hours. You have a quality control program. Like It takes a lot of preparation to get your business sales pro ready. And then even once the salesperson is in place, don't assume that you can just drop them and run, right? We tell our clients schedule daily conversations with them. They don't have to be wow. long conversations. Yeah, yeah. But you do need to check in with them every single day for at least the first two weeks. Yeah. They're going to stall out. They're mm. not going to want to look stupid. So they're not going to want to bring it up. They're going to have something that blows up in their face and you're not going to hear about it for three days and when somebody else comes in and tells you about it. So just having those daily check-ins. So it's just years and years of sales management experience that has allowed us to kind of streamline and systematize this so we can get you somebody who's a great fit for your brand. That's another thing most people don't get. They assume, hey, they're a good salesperson, but they may not be in alignment with your culture, with your values, with your demographics. So we want to make sure that you have somebody who's really, I like to think of them as your mini me, right? Yeah, so yeah. you want somebody who has your same energy, your same yeah. personality, the same tone of voice even. I know it sounds kind of crazy, wow. but we're listening for all of those pieces when we're matchmaking a sales pro with the entrepreneur. That's amazing. I, lo I love all the distinctions, all the qualities that you know to look for because you've tested and verified and used like processes and seen, hey, what works? And like just that, that the voice quality, the voice, voice tonality is the same. I, I would never think about that. <laughs> like, like, cause you think about hiring a, a, t a team member, you're like, I just want them to be good. I want them to be good at sales. Let's bring them on. You know, it's not enough. <laughs> well, I mean, it can be enough, but yeah. usually somebody who's good at sales, uh, well, number one, they're really expensive mm. because they know their value. They know they're going to bring, like, 
think last year one of my clients was brought in like two and a half million for her. Like I personally brought in two and a half million for her. Yeah. Right. So I, I know what I'm worth <laughs> as a salesperson. Yeah. Um, and so I expect to be paid really nicely for that volume of revenue that I bring in. Most entrepreneurs, when they're getting started at this level, aren't even paying themselves 10000 a month. Mm -hmm. So the idea of paying a salesperson 10000 a month is a little bit terrifying. So what we say is, well, let's build a system so that you don't need a 10000 a month guaranteed salary sort of person. You can find, I call them my baby unicorns, right? Let's find your baby <laughs> unicorn who's willing to work for like $2,000 a month yes. and they can grow with you to that $10,000 level because wow. at that level, you're bringing in $100,000 a month and it's totally worth it. So just recognizing that if you are willing to do the work of building a system that works, then you don't need an all-star in order to succeed in the process. And that's going to be better for you in the long run anyway, mm. because salespeople historically do not have really long track records. If you have a good salesperson for more than three years, you are winning. Right? <laughs> <laughs> most, most salespeople have that sort of personality that likes to keep challenging, finding new opportunities, moving forward. So you should only expect your salesperson to be with you max three years one to two years is probably more likely if you have a millennial um and just recognizing <laughs> that you don't want that turnover to affect your top line revenue yeah you need to make sure that you uh, have <laughs> you need to make sure that you have the systems in place that'll work no matter who's filling that spot yeah yeah it's it's so funny because i was hearing i heard i met a lot of people recently within the last like six months that said they were like top sales trainers for tony robbins i was like did he have this many top sales trainers? Like how many people like work for this guy, you know? But I guess with, with the sales profession, it's like they they got what they could, so to speak. They learned, they grew, they served, they you know became abundant in the skills. And they said, I want something different. I want something new. I want to do it on my own. I want to whatever. And I think that's like to have the processes ready and to also to be in a good relation with the salesperson so that we can end, we could anticipate something like that. Ideally, it's not just a, you know, a bomb that they drop say bye but they they are integrated into the culture and there's a good enough rapport that we're checking in and if there is discord or disharmony then we start to you know notice that earlier on than than oh bye you know i'm i'm, I'm here's my two weeks notice versus hey probably in a couple months i'm gonna be thinking about something different it's like it's good to be a a great in great rapport so that we can plan for something like that yeah, absolutely. And I will say that too often in this industry, people don't treat sales people well. Mm. Uh, there are certain, <laughs> there are certain closer factories. I won't name names, but they are churning out closers <laughs> um, who may or may not have any idea what they're doing. But as a result, there's sort of a glut on the market on mm. sales people. Um, mm. And I maybe you should stop using air quotes. Bless their hearts. They really are. <laughs> Um, but as a result, people just, they think that they can burn through people. Mm -hmm. um, and that breaks my heart, right? I was just interviewing one guy who went through our boot camp and he was telling me like instance after instance where he just got burned because the management kept changing everything and changing compensation and just not mm -hmm. paying commissions. And right, they just, there were, there was just too much inconsistency on the back end. I, I don't want to attribute a lack of integrity, but some of that is in our industry as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we're really looking for this to be a partnership. Yeah. We want somebody who you think of them as a growth partner and they yep. think of themselves as your growth partner. Mm. And you guys are working synergistically hand in hand to change people's lives and to create more revenue for the company. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I feel like that's in every culture we want to have that that team based mentality like if if it, if we're ever treating someone as just a moving piece so to speak a cog in the wheel that's that's what big corporations do and that's why people are not working for those and they're wanting to work with someone who gives them a more you know personal experience and is truly invested in our our leadership and growth and uh, I know you you probably have some systems for that too to like say how do I train and develop this this human being to be the best leader they can be the best salesperson to set powerful goals to have a great life like all that's important yeah one of our first things is your personal success plan and mm -hmm. it's i really think it's the key because you can't push a salesperson they have to set their own targets and we were just working with our clients with this on today on mm -hmm. this today where 
you they you ask how much do you want to make and it does yes. not matter what number they give you nope. Mm-hmm. You simply reverse engineer their activities mm-hmm. so that they know it's going to take me X, Y, or Z every single day in order for me to hit my personal income goals. Mm-hmm. And that's going to help you hit your income goals at the same time. But taking the time to get to know them as a person, say, why is that number important to you? What would that allow? I mean, having a sales conversation with your salesperson, I know it sounds hilarious, but knowing their goals, their motivation, their challenges, and their pain points, it's going to make you a better boss. So yeah. making sure that then, when they're off track, it's not you cracking the whip and saying, this needs to get done. It's saying, hey, remember when you set this goal for yourself? Mm -hmm. Remember why this was important to you? And then bringing them back to the heart of what they said they wanted. uh, It's going to make management 100% easier. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, what? So you you love sales. There's an intuitive kind of energy about it for you. You also love processes. Like, is there one that you like more than the other? Do you, do you have a, a a sweet spot or a zone of genius, or do you just like I love it all? <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't used to love processes. I will mm-hmm. say I fell in love with processes because I love freedom. And so for a lot of people who love freedom, the idea of systems and processes, I can attest to this, can feel constrained if you don't understand the context for them. So uh, you need systems. And one of my favorite rubrics that we use is uh, once you identify that there's a gap in your life or in your business, there's just two questions you need to ask. The first question is, is there a system for it? If the answer is no, then you go build a system. If the answer is yes, then the second question you ask is... What's broken? (laughs) Everybody follow the system. If the answer is no, then you go train the person. If the answer is yes, then we know something is broken and we have to fix the system. So it's either uh, we don't have a system, we haven't trained our person, or the system needs to be updated. And I mean, when I say every part of your life, I really do mean that, like, one morning, it was absolute chaos. We were late to school and everybody was grumpy. And I said, hey, this is not right. right? This is not <laughs> the end result we want to be creating in the conveyor belts of our mornings. Um, what went wrong? And I was like, is there a system in place? And I said, yes, there is a system in place. We make lunches the night before. We lay out clothes the night before. Shoes are by the front door. Jackets are on the hanger. Homework's in the backpack, right? Ready to go. So, Right? There is a system. So did everybody follow the system? Mm. No. Everyone did not follow the system. Mommy did not make lunches. The laundry was not done. Nobody could find their shoes, right? So it's just recognizing, ah, we need to train the team, which in this case is little ones and yourself. Yes. Um, but recognizing, okay, and we probably need accountability mechanisms in place now. Yeah. Right. So it's it's always like Literally every part of your business can come back to this rubric. Uh, either have a system or train a person. Wow. And so is it is it just looking at our business and saying like what what is the gap? What is what is the area that's not working? Um, you know, let's say someone says, "Hey, revenue isn't where I want it to be." Then we say, "Okay, there's a gap there. What is the system that's responsible for revenue? Let's go take a look at it. Let's go through it piece by piece and say, "Are we following it? If if yes, then you know something's broken. But if not, then we need to follow the system, get some proper training and, and implementation in it." Yes, 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 and yes. Um, I love the JP, James P. Friel introduced me to his freedom framework where he mm. breaks every business down into marketing, sales, delivery, operations, and finance. Mm. So usually most people collapse delivery and operations. Some people will collapse marketing and sales. So you could just have three buckets of sales, operations, and finance. But I like the five buckets for yeah. planning purposes. And then inside of each bucket, he asks, um, people, processes, and tools. Mm -hmm. So uh, inside of that, and then he just rates them red, yellow, green, uh, just like a stoplight and looks at every part of your business and at a very high level, you can say, okay, uh, marketing is the one that's red. We're just not getting enough leads in. So, okay, we're going to focus on the red marketing column. Then you can break it down and say, well, we have our funnel. The funnel's working, but Mm -hmm. our nurture sequence is not or whatever it is. Yeah. And then within that, you can say, okay, well, what specifically isn't working? Do we have the right people in the right seats? Do we have the right process, which is different from the tool? So a tool is like uh, Asana, 
-hmm. versus the tool is this is how we track our tasks. Mm -hmm. So it's having processes and procedures and then tools associated with each one. Mm -hmm. So that was a fantastic tool that he gave me that allowed me to really think about not just my business, but my clients' businesses as well, yeah. and really think through, yes, like literally everything from start to finish in your business can be broken down into this um, framework. And the beautiful thing is, again, if, if your long-term goal is freedom, mm -hmm. then that means you are making money without having to give your time in exchange for it. And so that is what we all really want to have is these, uh, what is... Uh, Polish say like easy, lucrative, and fun businesses yeah. are out businesses. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, even if you don't really love your business, you can still make it lucrative yeah. <laughs> and have it mostly run itself. So our family is thinking of traveling. Uh, well, we're planning on traveling for a couple of years, yeah. and that has given me a very high revenue target and simultaneously a very low hourly per hours per week target. Let's go. So yeah, we have 18 months, 18 months to systematize all operations and get everything off my plate. Okay. Um, so it really is just kind of taking that to the next level. But I probably, it's usually when you have a specific goal, like I want to sell my company in five years, mm. or I want to retire, or I want to travel, or if something traumatic happens, my wife's sick or whatever, I need more time. Yeah. So usually it's a reactive Thing. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, well, now I'll get my business working for me, uh, where I would encourage all entrepreneurs, even if you desperately love your work and can't imagine ever not having it in mm -hmm. your life, still build your business as if somebody else could run it, um, because then you have the choice to dip in and dip out, and it's, it's running itself, but it still allows you to be free. And who knows? I mean, entrepreneurs consistently are like salespeople, not so <laughs> You often like personal evolution. Right? Shiny object, yes. <laughs> so if you can just build a beautiful business that's generating money on its own, yeah. that frees you up to go start a new business that's, that's right. making money and all running on its own. So that I think is the end goal is is figuring out over time uh, what like pursuing your passion. So mm. I'm increasingly convinced that self expression is for me my highest value, right? I, I want a lot of money and I want all my time, but, mm. but not because I want to just sit on the couch and be bonbons. It's because I have novels that I want to write. It's because I have a world that I want to see. It's because I have yes. kids that I want to educate. It's because I want to like create transformation world. There's lots of beautiful things that I could do to be more self-expressed if I could get my business making a profit without me. So it's just, it's really thinking with, beginning with the end in mind and, yeah. and then reverse engineering everything you want to create from there. Wow. And then, and then I also hear like really taking, um, taking ownership, taking responsibility, sovereignty that like, I'm going to make this so, because I think a lot of people will also set goals and, and like they may not hit the mark exactly where they want to, or it might not be growing as quickly as it can be. But then we just get to say, Hey, if it is to be, it's up to me. If I want to, if I want to create something, I'm going to have faith that this vision was put into my mind for a reason. So mm -hmm. I think a really great question, which is the reason why you're here is who? Who can help me get to where I want to go? Who has the answers? Who has the systems, the processes, the ability to say, is this a red light area of my business? Do I need to improve it? Do I need to you know, fix the processes, the people, the tools, something? What is broken? And so I think it's just being a seeker committed to finding that solution. But I also love what you said about the specific goal. Like what is, where do we want to get to? And I think a lot of people haven't put thought into that. Even, even myself, you know, I'm like, okay, I want to travel the world. I want these things. Like I put tons of time and energy into my life plan, but I haven't really connected like the, the business growth and, and that it's like meeting it, you know, it's like, Oh, there's all these wishes and hopes and desires and fantasies, but like, where does the traction of like, you know, knowing my numbers every day, how many people do I got to call like a salesperson, you know, like, am I, am I doing that? Is the process being executed? If, if yes, great, keep doing it. If what, what's broken, what needs to be ch fixed, changed? Do I need to bring Caitlin in and give me a red light or a green light somewhere? Like, come on, you know? And I, I think it's, it's important to, to have that, that kind of a mindset. It's powerful. And I will also just add right on, cause you're absolutely right. Like the who, and sometimes it's a hire, sometimes it's a mentor. But I will say, to your point, you, you're like, how much have you ever, you've invested a lot in your business. So I was like, yes, right? Not only were the student loans for graduate school, 
But then I probably have consistently invested anywhere from $30,000 to $50,000 a year in myself, oh my most of the years of running my business. Wow. Um, because that's, for me, it's the fastest path, right? Mm -hmm. I do not, as a mom of three, plus my stepson, who's now 17 and sometimes with us, but like as a mom of three, sometimes four kids <laughs> who's running her business. And like, uh, yes, to your point, having sex with my husband every night and like has a <laughs> life. Um, and we travel almost every month now. That's like amazing. just there's a lot in my life that um, it really, it requires somebody to show me the way. I do not have time to figure this all out myself. Nope. It's just, it's it's always more expensive to figure it out on your own. Yeah. Um, because, and not even just in terms of failed attempts, right? I've had some pretty fantastic blenders that were very expensive, but just in opportunity cost, right? Mm. If you know you want to be making 10000 a month, every month that it takes you to figure out how to make $10,000 a month is $10,000 a month that you're not making. Wow. Most people don't think about that. Wow. But if you are like, no, I'm going to have a business that's running, a, like it's bringing in $100,000 a month. Every month that you are not figuring this out and getting to that level is $100,000 that you're leaving on the table. So investing 50 for somebody who can get you there even one month faster than you could have done it by yourself yeah. is going to be a two times return on your investment. So it's just thinking like a CEO would mm -hmm. in terms of where can I put my money uh, in such a way that I'm going to get to where I want to go as quickly as possible. Yeah. I want to know, Caitlin, you're great at sourcing great people, that A-level a talent, having the systems processes to bring them in and have them rock, right? I want to know, in terms of finding a, a mentor or someone to work with that who, that strategic partner, strategic alliance, how do you recommend people like design, reverse engineer that person who, who will rock their business, rock their world, help them get, get to where they want to go? What questions should we be asking ourselves to figure out who that person is? Yeah, that's so interesting uh, because this is where my feminine shows up. I have yet to have gone seeking a mentor. My mentor always just sort of appears like when the students write that <laughs> right? my mentors have always just sort of shown up. Um, and I really trusted my gut uh, on those. And so I think it's like my first mentor, it was it was a lot of money at that point. It was five thousand dollars, right? Which when you don't have a lot of savings and you max out your credit cards and you're talking to your husband about taking money out of his 401k account. Yes. It can feel like a heck of a lot of money, right? <laughs> um, and then it's mm -hmm. like, no, I'm I'm ready to move to the next level. Oh wow, fifty thousand dollars! Like that feels like a really a lot of money, mm -hmm. right? We're now at the point we're like, hmm, fifty thousand is probably not enough for us to feel the pinch, right? And <laughs> you probably want me to pay them a hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, ooh, that feels like a lot of money. <laughs> so, so I do think that there are advantages to investing at the highest possible level where you are definitely outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. Um, not only because you're going to get higher caliber people, usually it's not always the case, but I like to think that there is a correlation between the money you're investing. <laughs> but for me, because I take personal responsibility for that investment is yeah. I will determine how much money I make. So I know if I'm spending $100,000 on that mentor, mm. you better be darn well believing that I'm going to get another half million out of that relationship, whatever it takes, right? Yep. So having that really high dollar amount has always been a very powerful motivator and accountability mechanism for me personally. Yeah. Um, but that being said, I'm, I'm definitely open to the perfect mentor showing up in your life and being dirt cheap, right? Like, <laughs> I have to we'll just coach her or him about how to increase their prices. Um, but, <laughs> but I think it's, um, it is just, it, it really is getting clear on like tapping into your own personal intuition, hmm. figuring out where do you feel like you need support, and then just really being open to the universe, bringing that person into your life exactly at the moment that you need them. Hmm. I love it. I love it. I, th I think that's, that's really powerful because oftentimes we might be looking for, let's say, you know, for a, a significant other, people are searching for their, their other half, their relationship partner, whatever it might be, romantic partner. And mm -hmm. it's like the seeking of it with a, with a desperation energy causes that person to not show up, oh, right. Yeah. Or to get wrong yeah. matches. But the faith that the person is either on their way and, or they're arriving at the perfect time. 
and I just get to keep having fun and living my life because that person's going to show up. Um, yeah. That is when that person shows up. Absolutely. And that will just be a perfect bringing a wreck around. Like, same thing is true in sales. Mm-hmm. You cannot show up to a sales conversation desperate. <laughs> Desperation does not get the deal closed, right? Mm-hmm. You need to come from a place of absolute certainty, faith, and abundance. Mm-hmm. And that, I mean, that's true in every area of your life. I mean, that's, that's the bedrock for everything else that you do. And I know we teach sales, but I really think of it as like sales is my undercover way to teach spiritual principles and mindset because this is where like, this is the transformation is when Mm. you change your self identity, when you change your self worth, when you change your limiting beliefs, when you change what you think is possible over yourself then yes, everything does show up so much more easily. You don't have to go hustle and work your ass off and and do that grind because you just trust that the universe is your business partner and the universe knows who your perfect client is going to be and the universe is going to bring it to you whether you're marketing or not, right? So there's always plus sides, downsides. The feminine is like, trust and go with flow and see what happens. And the masculine is like, let's make a plan. Let's build some systems. Like... (laughs) really do need this beautiful balance between the yin and the yang. Um, but yes, it's like wherever you're too much of one, yeah. having a coach who can bring you back into the other. So when you're too much in a flow state and you figure, you know what, I'm just going to sit here and relax and I'm just going to think that things are going to happen, then your coach should probably bring you back towards the masculine side. Well, how about if you made a video? What do you think? <laughs> Let's put yourself out there and see if people reach out to you. But so, yeah, I think in every area of your life, but especially business, you really need both that faith and that trust and that passion, that desire, um, and that willingness to to make a plan and take action. Pray and move your feet. Mm-hmm. Well, I, what I love, Caitlin, is what you said about like sales is an undercover way to teach spirituality, right? Like. What a what a great I don't know like mindset ethos paradigm shift for everyone who who considers themselves spiritual or wants to grow their spirituality. It's like really take on whatever the vehicle is, not just and, and some people are spiritual coaches. Okay, cool, you you do you right, but I think a lot of people are like, how do I connect this with my ability to serve and impact humanity and and the entire world? Like, how do I do that? And I think that 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 is such a powerful reframe of like how we can show up and achieve both you know absolutely it's beautiful it is beautiful so we are we're just like crushing it and i want to know is there anything around putting in the processes putting in a a virtual sales team that we haven't yet covered that you feel is like a big it's a critical piece to the puzzle that you think most people might not know they they might be getting wrongs or anything like that that you feel we haven't yet touched on No, but one of our little tricks that we got from Chet Holmes, um, an ultimate sales machine, fantastic book. We wrote, uh, Nate Moore and I wrote Unseen Sales Machine, but Chet Holmes wrote Ultimate Sales Machine, and it's still one of my favorite books on sales and sales management ever. Um, He introduced the idea of the push, we call it the pushback interview. He doesn't call it that. He just calls it an interview. But (laughs) we call it the pushback interview because what we do is we, like when somebody comes to us and is a candidate, we will take them through this very detailed question about who they are and why they love sales and what their visions are. We build a lot of trust and rapport with them. And at the end of the call, we just say, yeah, I'm not hearing it. I really don't think I'm hearing top producer. And then we just sit in silence. And I couldn't do this, so I've hired this out. <laughs> but when we do it, it works beautifully. Uh, so it was one of those things where I knew the system had to be done, and I recognized I was not the right person to do that. Um, So now my recruiter takes those calls, but um, just seeing how they react to the pushback is really critical Mm. because what you're looking for in a salesperson is high ego, high empathy. Mm. You need somebody with ridiculously high self-confidence to the point of arrogance, and you need somebody who has ridiculously high empathy to the point of like intuition and empath, right? Wow. Now, the trouble is that you have a recipe for a diva, and that's why salespeople sort of get a reputation. So I'd like to think of sales management as like juggling kittens. You have to be really careful. because You don't want to hurt them, and they will sometimes scratch you, but it really is worth it in the end. Um, actually, I don't know if juggling kittens is ever worth it, but the <laughs> salespeople is. Um, so anyway, just seeing how they respond to that silence will tell you a lot about 
how they're going to respond to rejection on the sales call. If they just come back and say, fuck you, yeah, right? Maybe not your brand. <laughs> it might be. But, right. um, <laughs> and then like, or somebody's like, huh, that's really interesting. Tell me more about why you did that. Like, perfect, wow. right? You want wow. to can lean into the resistance. Mm-hmm. You don't want somebody who's like, oh, okay, well, thanks for your time. Bye-bye. And clicks up the phone, right? You don't want that person. So somewhere between the fuck you and the hanging up the phone, you want somebody who can (laughs) show up and like with empathy and, and good questions is able to lean into that resistance and and push back Mm -hmm. uh, against the so-called rejection and lean into it. So that one's a really fun trick that we've been using and uh, getting great results with. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Uh, I wanted to ask about your husband and how you're, you and him and your different personality styles and dynamics, how does that show up in your company and, and make you guys even more valuable of a team? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we are realizing that we are somewhat unique. Um, mm-hmm. My husband and I, like we literally do everything together. We're together pretty much 24 seven. We work from home. Uh, we raise the kids <laughs> together. Like, the only solution for us not getting along is going out and spending more time together. Um, <laughs> I that we're very blessed. Um, That's awesome. And, and I will say he was married before I had a broken engagement. So I think both of us really feel intense gratitude, like mm. as a second chance. Yeah. Uh, literally, he was my first love and he married somebody else. So very much second chance wow. um, at making this work. So wow. um Let's see. So his personality is more like the quiet certitude, very strong, but more reserved, obviously. The two people with this much energy would be a lot in a single asshole. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so I tend to be more the visionary. He's yeah. more of the integrator mm. in language. So he handles the finances, the operations, the technical side of things. He just makes sure that everything runs smoothly. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of the maverick who's like, well, let's create some stuff and sell some shit and then figure out how it works on the back end. So I think just recognizing that you generally marry somebody who is deeply different than you Mm -hmm. and appreciating the differences. Um, We just came back from our own mastermind and they were talking about relationships and she was preaching to the women and saying, Hey women, sometimes we try to turn our husbands into a clone of ourselves. And it was mm. like, ah, oh, it was so painfully true that sometimes I'm like, well, why aren't you more like me? Right. But at the end of the day, that's not actually what you want. Um, and yeah. so being able to fully appreciate your partner exactly as they are made yep. is really critical. Uh, the other thing is that both of us are really committed to our own personal development and journey. Yeah. Um, yeah. So scripture talks about don't be unequally yoked. I no longer think that scripture means what most Christians interpret it to mean. But I do think that you need two people who are committed to doing the inner work yeah. uh, because entrepreneurship is not an easy game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Marriage is not an easy game. Parenting mm-hmm. is not an easy game, right? Man. When you're trying to do really hard things, you need somebody who takes personal responsibility, uh, who owns their emotions, who owns their baggage who's willing to say i'm sorry um and so we we always are in a mastermind or a coaching relationship together and we've started having our own individual coaches that we work with uh, as well yeah to just support that and make sure that we're showing up clear and present and i mean it's not to say that we don't have fights like once a year we really have a big massive blowout um but it really it just it it minimizes the drama. Like yeah. you, it's very difficult to get traction in your business um, if you have friction at home. And, oh, yeah. and that's going to be like the first thing is there's, I'm, I'll just, I'll, I know we're on a total tangent, but <laughs> I find that a lot of female entrepreneurs when they finally get successful and start making money, I haven't proven this, but I would suspect that female entrepreneurs have a higher divorce rate than the general population. Mm. But suddenly they're empowered. They have their own money. That means that the power dynamic between the couples has shifted. Mm. And if the woman is not doing her inner work um, and recognizing that I need to prioritize my husband and this relationship, wow. time for this, and the husband isn't doing his inner work and saying, mm. like, it's totally okay for my wife to be a breadwinner. Um, and I'm happy to take care of the kids because she's making more money than I am. Like, if you guys aren't both willing to do that, I can absolutely understand how your marriage probably won't make it if mm. if you're not being really intentional about those pieces. 
Wow. That's, that is super powerful. Super powerful. And I think the, um, the willingness to have tough conversations early on in the relationship. And I mean, personal development is a lifelong thing, but um, I think there was a quote, quote that said, if you'll do what's hard now, life will be easy. If you'll do what's, if you'll do what's easy, only easy, then life will be hard. And so I think that after a while, the, there is this, this knowingness that there might be some, some rough waters temporarily, but hey, like we always go and grow through this. We always find resolution. We always figure it out and we're going to make mistakes. We're going to piss each other off. It's going to be okay. Like we just get to keep, if we need space, we get, we take space. If we need to come together. And I love what you said, like the way you guys handle it when you're having tough times is we got to hang out more. We got to go like, just be around each other and go, go do fun things. Yes. Yes. Like go on a date night, go, go do the things that we did when we were wanting to court each other. Right. Like that, that is what I think a lot of people stop doing is like, Oh, well I got, I got the person. So I don't need to keep winning them. It's like, no, like we're always personal development, personal growth mindset. We're always wanting to i i would i don't want to say impress but like to win them over to show them how much we we love them how much we care and last thing i heard you saying like the the um being there for each other if the woman's making money and she's the she's like owning her queenhood right owning her queenhood um but not treating the man as a king or vice versa if the man's owning his king kingship and not treating the woman as the queen then that's that imbalance of power like just creates resentment but when we see each other as the king and the queen and like we were able to acknowledge that power and also trust enough to let the the inner six-year-old out right the little little kid little little boy little girl then that there's some freaking magic there there really is yeah i think you nailed it um and when you were talking about the personal development thing what i realized is one of the advantages i came into this marriage with was i came with the assumption that marriage is supposed to make you holy not mm. happy and i wow. think a lot of people get married wow. thinking that that other person is going to make them happy mm. and you're like no 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 mm. the holiness which you however you define that right that personal development that crucible right yeah. that's the real work the happiness will come yeah. once the dross has been uh burned away but really making sure that your focus is this person is is here to help me become my best self yeah. even if that requires friction mm -hmm. right i firmly have the belief that everything in life is fodder for your spiritual development so even if your spouse doesn't feel like it support they're supporting you or you don't feel supported by your spouse is probably a better, more accurate way to say it. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that you can't show up in your marriage and love them unconditionally and support them and like pour yourself out to them, right? Because that's that's training. You're training them right? in a lot of ways yeah. um, of their own self worth. I mean, every one of us is going through this life trying to find their way back to healed and healthy and whole, um, and so that's that's kind of your mission uh, is you start with your spouse not to fix them but mm. to be that sacred space wow. that phrase again where they can really tap into their greatest possible self mm. i love it caitlin we, we've just scratched the surface on the relationship stuff which we're going to be talking about later in february we are also just scratching the surface with the sales and the processes and all the freaking brilliance that you have to contribute to people and their companies growing. So how do they take the next steps with you, especially if they want to find out if it's the right time for them to, to bring on a salesperson, if they want to get you looking at their business and seeing, hey, what, what are the tweaks that can be made? What could the next steps be? And if there is a potential fit between you two, how would you move forward? How can they take those next steps? Yeah, so you can find us at salesmap.me. That is the full URL, not a com. So salesmap.me. Uh, you can also email me, Caitlin, C-A-I-T-L-I-N at salesmap.me. Happy to just connect with you and chat with you and see how we can support you. Uh, part of our sales process is just a diagnosis, like we do an audit and say, okay, what would it take to get your business to 100,000 a month or add an additional 100,000 per month into onto your top line revenue? And we will literally lay out the entire plan for you, sales, marketing, and operations. And then at the end of it, we will make a recommendation. It might be to bring on a salesperson. It's entirely possible. It might not be to be the salesperson. <laughs> uh, but at the very least, we want to make sure that you have a game plan. Uh, we call it our 1.2 and 12, right? Mm -hmm. How can we get you a $1.2 million run rate for the next 12 months? 
Uh, so you really walk away with a clear action plan of what it's going to take to get your business to seven figures, or if you're already at seven figures, how to add another multiplier onto that. Mm. Mm. This is this is gold, Caitlin. I love it. So they go to www.salesmap.me, and that's S A L E S M A P dot me. You could also check it in this in the show notes. I put it on Facebook stream, Caitlin. You are amazing. I'm, I'm super, super grateful to just be connected with you. Um, shout out to Matt Wright. Dude's a freaking legend for connecting us. And I'm going to be stopping by in Apple Valley on our on our way to San Diego one of these times. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a blast. Awesome. Love it. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, okay? Thank you, Chris. All right, we'll see you soon.